Good morning, folks, and welcome to the South Carolina Confederate Relic Room and Military Museum's History at Home Talk. Uh, today we're doing a very interesting topic, at least to me. We're going to talk about some of South Carolina's aviators a uh, little more than a century ago in what was then called the Great War, because then only the real pessimists thought that it would only be the first world war. So welcome here. And since we're going to uh, tackle a slightly different topic today, I hope you all are prepared. I have my silk scarf. I can cut out the glare and deflect the engine oil when necessary. Uh, and remember, it's going to be cold up there. We are going to move from the state's finest military museum in Columbia, South Carolina, into the war-torn skies of the First World War. Now, one of the aspects of that war that's very very different to us, very foreign sort of to our thinking today, is that the United States was way behind. In 1918, the world had been at war for four years, and the United States had spent most of that time frantically trying to stay out of the conflagration. We're trying to stay out of this terrible, terrible conflict, and uh, that was certainly understandable. However, while staying out, we took pains not to get ready in some ways, and one of those ways was aviation. Uh, aviation was born in the United States, no matter what Soviet propaganda said. Uh, Orville and Wilbur Wright had invented the heavier-than-air flying machine. Uh, and the second place fellow, Langley, well, he was an American too. But after aviation was born in the United States, it did not advance greatly over the next 15 or 16 years. Uh, in fact, in 1916, when our army was chasing Pancho Villa, on the Mexican border. Well, our airplanes still kind of looked like a box kite with a lawnmower engine. They were useful for observation, not all that useful even for that. Meanwhile, the pressure of war in Europe had driven European countries uh, on both sides to develop aircraft much more quickly and with a lot of important upgrades uh, to make them worthy of combat in the air. So the United States is going to join the air war very unprepared for it when we got involved in the Great War. And the South Carolinians that we'll meet today that we're going to speak about who are part of that conflict, well, they also are going to they also are going to be joining uh, a, a radical shift in technology by crossing the Atlantic in 1917 and 1918. They were moving ahead in military technology by a lot. Uh, in fact, I, I like to compare when the South Carolina troops were sent to the Mexican border right before we got into World War I. World War I was already going on overseas. And our fellows on the Mexican border, well, they were using Apache scouts. They were wearing Stetson cowboy style army issue hats, Stetson campaign hats, and carrying uh, six shooters in a lot of cases. Uh, many troops were still being issued six shot single action Colt revolvers. Others began to have the new automatic pistol, but it was more of a Wild West adventure for a year down there. Then the same troops were back home less than a month and were called up to be sent to Europe. 
when they moved into the trench warfare atmosphere, the trench warfare atmosphere was like shifting forward. Uh, technologically and in a lot of other ways. And there were always the adventurers who were ready to get out in front of that technology and uh, to undertake that adventure and make their contribution that way. So let's uh, meet, and today we're going to see some great original images from the collections of a couple of South Carolinians. Everybody who watched Wednesday is keeping their fingers crossed about my slideshow this time around. Uh, we're kicking off here. Here is a picture of a relatively typical First World War aircraft. This is a two-seat observation plane. It's particularly maneuverable because of that, that biplane structure. The um, top and bottom wings, the, the biplane had a lot of lift area. So you got very dramatic close turning maneuvers out of these aircraft. But the body of the aircraft itself is a wooden frame wrapped with canvas. So what's between me and hostile bullets is some cloth in a lot of cases. Uh, not counting the engine block, there's really not a lot to protect me. In a two-seater aircraft, uh, I do have, watch out, Joe's gonna try something tricky here. Look up here, you can see a forward firing fixed gun that doesn't move. The pilot sits here. Back here sits the gunner observer. He has a weapon on a swivel mount to try to protect the aircraft. Uh, and an important thing about that gun on the swivel mount, don't shoot off your own tail surfaces, uh, which was a distinct danger in these aircraft. Now, in the years before the United States became involved in World War I, the idea of the flying ace of a, a pilot who was a, a national hero had very much been born and was strongly being carried forward. And if you think about it, it makes sense. When you study World War I's battles, it's grim, it's miserable, and hundreds of thousands of men are sent forward into attacks where they fight very anonymously. And the death and destruction are on a huge scale, and they're also rather impersonal. A lot of families at home are going to get a terrible letter. And rather than describing exactly what happened to the young man that they've lost, uh, they'll get word that he was presumed lost because that day a lot of men went forward into no man's land. And then in that ground fighting, many men were never seen again. And uh, the body might be out in a shell hole it might have fallen in the enemy trenches. Uh, there's just no way to track what happened to so many lost and lost apparently to no good effect. This is very discouraging for the people at home. Now, by contrast, these brightly colored machines flying over the trenches, well, they're not fighting anonymously at all. Quite the opposite. When these aircraft fight each other, the men in the trenches witness it. And you have people getting on the field telephone and calling back reports of exactly what they've seen and describing how a particular model of aircraft on a particular day shot down another in their sector. And it's almost a, um, a, a fan club atmosphere in a sense begins to develop around these flying aces because they are indeed national heroes. So the man on the left, uh, perhaps you won't recognize him by his name, but you'll certainly recognize him by his nickname as the most famous pilot, and certainly the most famous fighter pilot in history. Uh, Richter Manfred von Richthofen is a German. His, his title is Knight or Ritter. 
And at the beginning of the war, he'd actually been a cavalry soldier wielding a saber against the Russians on the Eastern Front. But he had made the transfer to aviation, and that is where he became known as the Red Knight, or almost universally today as the Red Baron. Manfred von Richthofen was, in some ways, a perfect fighter pilot. A brave, aristocratic, daring, calculating, and he was a gentleman. If Richthofen shot you down and you happened to survive, now that's very iffy because there are no parachutes in these small aircraft. Uh, you have to ride the machine down. But if you have survived your crash landing on German, on German territory, very likely Richthofen's going to try to send a staff car to pick you up and bring you to the officer's mess at his aerodrome, where you will have a nice dinner with him that night, drink some wine, tell stories back and forth about flying uh, before you head off to be interned for the rest of the war. And von Richthofen would make a little silver cup to award to himself. It would have the name of your model of airplane that he had shot down and the date on which he had shot you down, and it would go into his collection. By the end of the war, uh, by the end of his fighting career, Manfred von Richthofen had 80 of these silver cups, 80 confirmed air-to-air -air victories. Certainly an A-list celebrity, and certainly very different um, in attitude in the fighting in the air than the fighting on the ground. Now, sometimes the chivalry of the airmen is overstated. But still, there was a feeling between the pilots that they underwent similar dangers and that the fellow who had happened to be flying for the other side um, quite possibly was a guy much like you, just trying to do his duty. And flying was so dangerous, even without combat, that before the war began, there was sort of an international brotherhood of pilots. And at the beginning of the war, of course, all the experienced pilots in the European nations begin flying for their countries. And many of the people fighting each other actually know one another and traditions develop. Well, when von Richthofen was shot down and killed, uh, and by the way, there's an argument about that to this day, whether it was a British fighter pilot who brought him down or whether it was an anti-aircraft battery. Um, that is kind of a argument between the Canadians and the Australians who each take credit. But when von Richthofen was shot down, and it was learned on the Allied side that he had been killed, the British actually sent airplanes to overfly his funeral. And these airplanes trailed black streamers behind them to show that they were in mourning and were not undergoing a combat operation. And instead of bombs, they dropped flowers on the enemy uh, to show their mourning as a toast in the British officers' mess went um, to our gallant foe. Now, again, often this um, could be a little overstated, the chivalry of the air. The top scoring British ace, Mickey Manock, was an Irishman and a socialist and uh, didn't care for all of this aristocratic stuff. And that night when the toast was drunk in his mess and they raised a glass to our gallant foe, Mickey Manock was heard to mumble before he drank, I hope he roasted all the way down. So nastiness certainly occurred, but there was a general impression uh, and many of the pilots tried to forward it and carry it out that this was gentlemen's warfare. And the countries that sponsored the different nations, I, I'm sorry, I tried to read and speak at the same time. The countries from which the various uh, pilots come from often upheld them deliberately as heroes to the public in contrast to the anonymous warfare going on on the ground. And this is when we got the term flying ace. Uh, you became officially an ace if you had shot down five enemy airplanes. And this was a distinction that the men worked very hard for. 
And it's going to be a truth of air warfare for many years to come. And certainly in World War II, most enemy airplanes were shot down by a small fraction of the fighter pilots. Now, you had sort of your A-list celebrities like von Richthofen here, still famous to this day. And then you had guys who were more for a select audience, but very, uh, very well known in their own right within a certain group. The man you see on uh, Richthofen's left here, on the right side of this screen, Eugene Bullard. Well, Eugene Bullard is a French fighter pilot, or anyway, he's flying a French airplane in combat with French insignia, but Eugene Bullard is from Augusta, Georgia. And Bullard was the only black fighter pilot of World War I. He's got a fascinating life story. He obviously was the inspiration for one of the characters in Flyboys, because uh, a film about 10 years ago, I think, because right before the war had broken out, Eugene Bullard was making his living as a prize fighter in Paris. Uh, he was a man gifted in a great number of ways, and his father apparently had decided to move their family from the American South to France. The story is that he had nearly been lynched in Augusta, and in response to that atmosphere, he wanted to go somewhere else. And Eugene Bullard became very loyal to and fond of his new country, France. And when the war broke out, he joined the French Foreign Legion and then transferred to the air service. Unlike the film, he didn't serve with the other American pilots. He served in a French squadron. You could sort of put your own heraldry on the side of your airplane. And this is Bullard's personal symbol here from his nickname. Uh, he was called the Black Swan. And another thing you might notice in this picture, just a little unusual here. Yeah, that's a, that's a monkey. Because his life wasn't dangerous enough flying a rickety airplane into combat. He actually flew a number of his missions with his pet monkey in there with him. Uh, hopefully it didn't push buttons and pull levers. Uh, but exotic pets were kind of a pilot tradition. Uh, that film... Fly Boys that I referenced, uh, one of the funny things in that movie is that the least believable parts are true. Um, the Lafayette Escadrille, the squadron portrayed there, had not one, as in the movie, but two lions as squadron pets that would wander around. They'd walk into your sleeping quarters. Uh, a mother and cub, whiskey and soda, were the squadron mascots, who never ate anybody. Uh, but... The fighter pilots are living a somewhat exotic lifestyle, often, certainly compared to the men in the trenches, and building up their legends. And consequently, then and now, World War I fighter pilots get all of the attention. They painted their machines in colorful and interesting ways. By the way, just, just an aside here, this is the last this is the last aircraft I would like to fly into combat. Not that I'm an expert, but if you were a German and you had a choice which airplane to aim for, wouldn't you shoot at the flying fish? But while the fighter pilots are getting an awful lot of attention and to this day are very famous figures in a lot of cases, uh, and all the World War II aces, were young boys who grew up on stories of fighter pilots like Elliot White Springs of South Carolina. If you ever get a chance to catch my colleague Fritz Hamer's talk uh, on World War I flyers, uh, he's a terrific one for Elliot White Springs. Remember, five victories was the uh, qualification for being an ace. Elliot White Springs once shot down five enemy airplanes in just one day. And later, came home to inherit the Springs textile mill fortune and revolutionize American advertising. Just a fascinating guy. During World War II, as they were training Second World War pilots in South Carolina, Elliot White Springs liked to show up um, in a limousine driven by a chauffeur carrying a, a silver-headed walking stick and wearing a big black cape. And he would hop out like a superhero and head to the podium to tell them stories. 
And by the way, his books are worth your time if you want to learn about World War I flying firsthand. But although the fighter pilots get the attention, the fighter pilots were only there to control the sky for other airplanes doing different jobs. It didn't matter much to the men on the ground if fighter pilots were shooting one another down or not. It mattered a great deal whether airplanes were gathering and using information uh, to help the high command. Now we think of fighters that shoot down enemy airplanes and bombers that dump tons of explosives accurately onto enemy positions because we're thinking from a World War II point of view. In World War I, bombing was pretty primitive and not very accurate. Uh, it actually started with pilots literally tossing hand grenades out of their aircraft toward enemy positions, which could be loud and frightening perhaps, but it's not a high probability of success strategy. And these primitive airplanes with their limited fuel could carry a small load of bombs to dump fairly inaccurately and then fly home. Or they could use their precious fuel and air minutes to help the artillery deliver much more high explosive, much more accurately by observing and correcting the fall of artillery shells. The other thing they're doing is flying over enemy positions and taking photographs. For the first time in history, commanders could work from information uh, that was gathered that way so you could literally see, and remember it was a very static war, so you had time for the photographs to be developed and the information hadn't changed you could see many things about the enemy positions that could never have been seen before. But this depended on aircraft with at least two seats, and it depended on aircraft often to do these jobs. They had to fly fairly low, slow, and in a straight line. So you notice what this squadron chose to put on their aircraft instead of a Falcon or a bat or some sort of uh, deadly insignia. They have a barnyard chick because that's uh, perhaps I'm going to suggest that's because they felt so helpless up there in the air. And the men who flew these machines, both the pilots and the gunner observers in the back, the gunner observer was often the senior guy and the airplane commander. Uh, their story doesn't get told as much and we're going to spend a little time with them. By the way, this AR on the back within the French tricolor tail here, it stands for Avion Reconnaissance, which I'm surely pronouncing wrong. But when Americans were given these aircraft, remember I said we were behind the times. We didn't keep up with the technology. So um, not a single American made aircraft served in World War I. Uh, we made pieces for some de Havilland bombers, we made engines, but the aircraft we fought that war with were British and French castoffs. When they got new models, they gave their outdated, their slightly obsolete models to the Americans, and that's what the Americans flew. I'm happy to say this is one lesson we managed to learn from history. In the buildup to World War II, we still said we don't want to be part of the European war. We also said, hey, if we get caught up in one again, we're going to have the best airplanes in the world, thank you very much, and plenty of them. And so we began producing and upgrading our air fleet just in time for uh, Pearl Harbor. But the AR machine, the Avion Reconnaissance, the Americans flying it said that AR stood for antique rattle trap. And it's in one of these antique rattle traps that Harrison Saunders of Sumter, South Carolina is going to win decorations for valor. Now I mentioned already the fellow in the back of the aircraft, the gunner observer, his job is to make those observations, to bring back that information, 
if the plane is equipped with a camera, he's the one taking photographs. If the plane is correcting artillery, um, these guys did not have a radio small enough to carry in an airplane. Your cell phone can today can do things that a, a wagon-sized communication station could not do in World War I. And the only kind of radio transmitter small enough to fly with uh, was a wireless telegraph transmitter. And this wireless telegraph transmitter, you had to tap out Morse code. Uh, and that's the only way you could communicate with the big artillery pieces that you are trying to, um, trying to correct the fire of. So if you could think about it, you're flying over the battlefield as a gunner observer, and here you are in an open cockpit, and you're trying to look at what's happening on the ground and accurately match it up with a map. And then you have to transmit the information the artillery needs by tapping out Morse code on this wireless transmitter, and at the same time, you, as the gunner observer, are the one who is responsible for watching for enemy aircraft and fighting them off with the swivel machine gun. So uh, the memoirs of one flyer who served in both positions during the war, uh, he actually said, it was a great relief when I got my pilot wings from then on, I was just a truck driver and didn't have to make any decisions or have nearly as many worries. Uh, however, the guy in the back, the gunner observer, uh, is not going to be recognized, certainly not going to become a, a folk hero in most cases to the folks back home. But Captain William Harrison Saunders of Sumter, South Carolina, Maybe he should be. Saunders left for the war a little bit early. He was in the first group that went over because he spoke fluent French and was a West Point trained artillery officer. He transferred to aviation in order to uh, be a master of artillery correction from the sky. And one of his jobs was to take the entire curriculum by which the French trained their gunner observers and translate that curriculum into English uh, and begin training our own backseaters. Here's Saunders here uh, in his ID card, a devil may care looking guy. Look carefully at his insignia here. The backseater, the gunner observer, the gunner observer, rather than having a full set of wings, the gunner observer's insignia right here is one wing or half a set. And it would be on half a wing in a prayer that uh, Harrison Saunders fought his war. A good looking fella and one of those people who established the reputation of flyers. Uh, we think of you know, the characters from Top Gun or Ba Ba Black Sheep or those other uh, war aviation movies as uh, men who fought hard, were decisive and aggressive, and also are sort of partying like madmen with an eat, drink, and be merry attitude in between battles. Not every pilot's like that. William Harrison Saunders seems to have lived up to it. And a note from his French squadron commander while he was in training with the French, first of all remarked on what a good shot he was, said he was a tremendous marksman, as we expect from an American. And then he went on to say something they did not expect from an American, what a charming comrade he was for us. And you see Saunders here in one of his aircraft, and I've mentioned squadron markings a couple of times, these guys have a vulture riding an artillery shell. So they're focused on the accuracy of the artillery is the big contribution they can make to the battlefield. Uh, she's also got a name, by the way. 
This bird is Old Carolina, the fourth. And I guess we can easily imagine what happened to Old Carolina, one through three. Here we have a better look at. But there's three aerial victories claimed painted along this thing as well. Uh, and you see the twin Lewis machine guns used to protect the aircraft. Uh, you also see they have dressed very warmly for this open cockpit over the front. Uh, British flag on one side, an American on this. And again, this is one of those cast off machines uh, given to the Americans. Whoop. One of the things that Saunders translated that really struck me uh, was French instructions on the method of shooting at the enemy aircraft for the guy in back. And I'm just going to take a second on one of the cool parts here. Uh, the instructions tell you where the point of aim is because just like a shotgun with a dove, you have got to aim ahead of the flying target. But if you're in the back of one of these airplanes, your advantage is you can predict where he's going to be because he's trying to get a firing point on you. So if this is the back of my airplane and the enemy aircraft is trying to attack me, if I see him in that position, he's moving to attack position. If I fire here, then he should come over. Uh, he should fly into my bullets. If he doesn't fly into them, it's because he's not trying to attack me. He said it's somewhere else. And so I feel safer that way. Um, so we have diagrams both front and back, again, translated. But this one's my favorite. This is based on how close the enemy is. See, he's only this big, then he's that big, then he's that big. He gets bigger as he comes into range. And this is your point of aim. But this over here is how long you should fire. There's, it says, tack, 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 tack. Now he's getting closer. Tack, 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 tack. Increasingly long bursts from your machine guns until he's so close it doesn't matter how much ammo you use or the possibility of a jam. Tack, 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 and so on. <laughs> so if he's that close, I just hold down that trigger. Saunders is going to make a very distinguished career for himself as a flyer. Uh, he receives a distinguished flying cross and two citations from General Pershing himself. Let's go look at the young man again as I speak about him. And his future in the United States Army Air Corps certainly seemed assured. In fact, he became so good at his job that he was sent home early in the summer of 1918 uh, against his very strenuous protests. His squadron commander told him, Saunders, you are the greatest repository of knowledge that we have about how to use the airplane in close support. And the US Army needs your knowledge and the way you fly, young man, guarantees that you're going to die. We have got to get you home and safe so that knowledge will be preserved. And so he's going to actually miss the last big offensive of the war, the last half year of the war, the victory celebrations. He was sent home early as a hero, but um, he missed the flying. He was sent to be an instructor at Fort Sill, Oklahoma to work together with the artillery and the aircraft from then on. Well, about a year after the war, his old pilot came through town. Uh, they met at the officer's club and Saunders asked him to take him up on a flight. Uh, and the two men sort of went off on just a pleasure flight in this aircraft for old time's sake and crashed and burned. And one of the great what ifs about Harrison Saunders he was a very winning, charming kind of guy. And he was a guy who agreed with the great air strategist, Billy Mitchell. Billy Mitchell was a man with no tact or diplomacy. Billy Mitchell 
arguing for air power, managed to destroy his career. He also predicted Pearl Harbor, and everyone ignored it. If Billy Mitchell had had Harrison Saunders to help him out, uh, I think that we might have a different history of the American Air Corps between the wars. And those of you that are local and familiar with Shaw Air Force Base, Erwin Shaw, like Harrison Saunders, was a backseat gunner observer, uh, and he was shot down and killed in a Bristol two-seat fighter. When they were talking about naming Shaw Air Force Base, it was going to be named after one of two local heroes from Sumter, South Carolina. One, of course, was Erwin Shaw, who won out. The other one was Harrison Saunders. It was nearly Saunders Air Force Base. Another untold part, often, of the air service story, of the aviation story from World War I, all the attention on the fighter pilots, very little attention on the support folks. And it's worthwhile thinking about why you would decide to join the air service. And there were a lot of good reasons for that. There were certainly the flight crew were often folks who had been reading the stories of the flying aces in the newspaper. They were adventurous uh, and they wanted to see combat. And perhaps they saw some of the advantages of combat in the air service. It was just as dangerous as being in the very front trench. Statistically, you were as likely to die. However, after an airman had fought his battle, he flew home where he had a shower and a nice meal, sat around the piano to drink wine and sing some songs with his comrades on a nice evening. And if he woke up the next day and the weather was awful, well, bad flying weather meant a day off from danger. In the trenches, if you woke up and it was raining, you were wet. And that was the only difference. So that part was attractive. Another part that was attractive, this young man from Charleston, South Carolina, Charles Brogdon, he went and became an air mechanic. He received training through the military that is going to help him a lot after the war. And another appeal, not very subtle in this recruiting poster, over there is the great American slogan for World War I. Uh, but this poster suggests you want to be over there on the ground behind the lines in the air service. Well, what does on the ground behind the lines sound like? It sounds like, hey, son, you've been reading about the terrible battles in which hundreds of thousands are dying uselessly. Wouldn't you rather be miles and miles back from the front itself working on airplanes? And you don't need to fly on them. We need a lot of folks to make these things work. And the suggestion is, if you're a skilled worker, uh, we'll keep you out of danger. Folks, always be careful with recruiters. Look who they want. Woodworkers, that makes sense, wooden framed aircraft. Tailors, tailors used to working with cloth. Tailors and carpenters to work on these wooden cloth airplanes. They also want photographers. Okay, if you are a photographer in one of these airplanes, you are not gonna be on the ground behind the lines. The only lines you're gonna be behind is enemy lines as you fly extremely dangerous missions. And here we have the return of a group of men from France. You can think of a lot of these guys probably grew up barefoot plowing behind a mule and now they've been working with aviation technology and mechanized things and much more advanced systems in this war. They're gonna bring that knowledge home. In fact, pilots often become crop dusters after the war. Okay, I've been going on and on a bit because I love this subject. You had to be able to identify an enemy aircraft by its silhouette. Um, you didn't have long to decide which side it was on before you had to shoot at it or he might be shooting at you. One of the things in World War I to look for was the tail. If it was a nice swept bird looking tail, aesthetically pleasing, that airplane's trying to kill you, that's an Axis airplane. But if you can imagine the most dangerous position is when you're looking at them from the front, very hard to tell who is who from the front 
of one of these biplane aircraft. Maybe if the Germans are flying the triplane with the third wing, except the British had a triplane too. We covered that topic. Now, every time there's a big advance in technology, there are things that change the world and there are sort of false starts that happen at the same time. Things that look like they're going to change the world and have a much smaller effect than everyone anticipated. And in World War I, one of those things is the dirigible. Uh, the science fiction books of 1900 pre predicted huge strategic bombing campaigns carried out by airships. Meanwhile, heavier than air airplanes were thought to be, by comparison, insignificant. They couldn't go as far, they couldn't carry as much, their performance wasn't great, and nobody expected them to get better at the same rate that we in our lifetimes have seen uh, certain technologies advance. Uh, they were expecting something much like the Wright Brothers airplane for a long time to come. So a lot of hope was put in airships. When the war came, the Germans actually did for a while try to use airships for strategic bombing. That's a story in itself. But we're gonna take the look at some original photos here from the photo album of a man from Columbia, South Carolina, who found himself in a very unusual job in World War I, a sailor, and he found himself inside the gondola of a blimp. The word blimp actually happened in World War I. Um, a Royal Navy officer apparently walked up to one of these aircraft and thumped it, and thumped it with a finger. And then he imitated the sound he thought it made, blimp, blimp. And apparently we've been calling them blimps ever since. A blimp is held in shape by the gas inside the balloon part. A dirigible, a different kind of airship, has a wooden skeleton with, with uh, cloth wrapped around it, just like aircraft did at the time. And that's what holds the gas in, but if all the gas were let out, it would keep its shape. That's the difference between a blimp and a dirigible. They were both out there, but dirigibles were generally considered bigger and more useful. Uh, when the relic room reopens, you'll be able to come in and see this helmet, but you won't get as close to it as we can get here. This helmet, this flight helmet, is one of the very few items that was brought home um, by Franklin Griffin. James Franklin Griffin of Columbia, South Carolina, uh, wrote in his memoirs years later that when he left the Navy at the end of World War I, he sold his uniform, uh, he actually, turned it in at a pawn shop and got a cheap civilian suit with it as quickly as possible. He wanted to transition back to his normal life. All he kept were this helmet and a scrapbook that we're showing you some images from. On the sides of his leather flight helmet, he has written different bases that he visited in France, as well as airships and blimps that he flew aboard as a crewman. And this photo right here, to get an idea of the size of this hangar that he's taken a photograph of, that is a full-size airship. So this hangar is big enough that you could put several inflated full-size airships inside it. Oh. So as we consider these craft for a second, since airplanes had improved, it would be suicidal to fly these where aircraft could reach. And that's what the Germans learned in their strategic bombing campaign of London with their Zeppelins. Uh, the only way to be safe was to stay so high the aircraft couldn't reach you in time. But these are not filled with helium like the Goodyear blimp is today. They were filled with hydrogen. And hydrogen is highly flammable. So a few tracer bullets into one of these things would turn it into a flying inferno of death. 
um, it was a fatal place to be. However, there was one job that these could do better than any other technology of World War I. And it had to do with what dragged the United States into war in the first place, and that was U-boat warfare. There were vast sections of ocean that were far enough away from German our airfields that German airplanes were no threat. They couldn't reach you. But the U-boats were a threat. Well, it turned out that these aircraft could travel with the ships in a convoy, much longer range and endurance. In fact, the men inside the gondola could take turns sleeping and work in shifts. And they were usually in a position where they could spot a U-boat before it could attack. The U-boats of World War I are very primitive and they had to stick their periscope up in order to attack. And sometimes if you were looking down from high enough, you could actually see them under the water even if the periscope wasn't sticking up. Most importantly, they ran on the surface most of the time and would only go underwater as they came up to where they might be spotted from the deck of a ship because they couldn't stay under that long. Well, if your vantage point was way high in the sky in one of these, then you could see those U-boats much farther off before they submerged. And they were very effective uh, in patrolling. In fact, they were effective enough, we brought them back in World War II. And the United States Navy could successfully boast that it never lost a ship to a submarine if that ship was escorted by a blimp. Doesn't mean they were a wonder weapon, but they were extremely good for that one particular duty. And when James Griffin headed overseas, he had a much more boring job in mind. Uh, he had joined the Navy and become a yeoman or a, a clerk. And it just so happened they made him the clerk to a weatherman. Uh, and this was a Naval Reserve officer who had recently written a textbook at Harvard about meteorology. He was on the cutting edge of weather prediction. And so he told his clerk, I need high altitude pressure readings uh, to make better weather predictions. And so I'm sending you to Gunner Observer School uh, to qualify you for aviation. And I, this kind of astounded Griffin, but he said, okay, yes, sir, I'll do that, aye, aye, sir. Uh, and he fell in love with flying, and after doing the meteorology job for a while, transferred full-time to the blimps. So you never know what direction um, service will take you, and James Franklin Griffin's service is fascinating stuff. One of the neat things in his book, and this is not part of this slideshow, I'm afraid. But there was a photograph in there of several sailors. And these sailors are talking to a VIP who is visiting the airfield. And in the scrapbook, there's a little arrow drawn above the photo to one of the guys. You can barely see, you know, they're just silhouettes. And the arrow says, me. And he's shaking hands with some kind of VIP visiting the airfield. Um, and when I talked to the Naval Airship Association about this to get some information on the photo years ago, they got very excited. There was only one VIP that ever visited that airfield in France. He was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy in 1918, and his name was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So in the picture where, uh, Griffin has himself labeled as me shaking hands with somebody. He's shaking hands with FDR and the later pages of his scrapbook are filled with FDR campaign memorabilia from the 1930s when Griffin, the young sky sailor, uh, has become one of FDR's uh, campaign people in South Carolina. So thank you folks. I enjoy talking about this particular subject. World War I aviation is just fascinating. Um, does anybody have any questions? Next Friday for uh, the Relic Room's Lunch and Learn, which is going to be at noon, that's going to be a live session uh, by a gallant uh, and very interesting pilot from the Vietnam War. Uh, so check in with us 
if you can. Thank you all very much. Uh, somebody commented much earlier in the program today, um, is that where NASA got their idea of monkeys in space? Uh, and that's referring to the World War I pilot who carried a monkey in his cockpit as a, as a mascot. Uh, no, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, monkeys in space was one technology idea the Soviets really did have first before us. Uh, I could be wrong on that one. You'll have to do the research. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure that NASA did not see Eugene Bullard's photograph from the French Air Force. So that, that almost certainly wasn't where the idea came from. Oh, thank you, folks. I forgot to mention a couple of things about my outfit. Of course, the silk scarf to protect my neck from chafing and make me look gallant is naturally a gift from a lady friend. Uh, the warm coat. Of course, I want to wear a warm coat. But this particular warm coat is a legacy from my son, Romeo Company, uh, class of 19, at the Citadel. You see the Citadel buttons here. And one of the first United States Army qualified pilots was a Citadel man who went on to fly in the Mexican punitive expedition and World War I, another fellow who doesn't get nearly as much credit as he should. Thank you very much, folks. Be watching for next week's topic. What aircraft are those in the background? Well, I could have pretended that question wasn't asked because I grabbed this background in a hurry just as I was getting ready to do this presentation. But uh, let's pretend we're an observer making a choice. We're at the perfect angle to be able to tell that rondelle there, that's an insignia, but it's not the first thing I'm going to look for. The first thing I'm going to look for is the way this is a squared off tail and not a swallow tail. That's reassuring to me if I'm an ally. It is not a German aircraft. Uh, and these are definitely two seaters. And they look French. One, two, three. That tricolor on the back looks like it's probably French. I can't tell if the middle of the rondelle is blue or red, but you can see how little help insignia would have been to you in making a quick decision on these aircraft. But I'm afraid I grabbed a rather generic historic photograph from World War I without being strictly able to identify those particular aircraft. Uh, forgive me for not being able to answer that question. Thank you very much today, folks, and I hope that you all have a great weekend, uh, and I'm going to be signing out.